Hi, everyone, and welcome to our workshop today. I'm very excited that you're here. I'm Mallory Tenori, Associate Director of the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas at the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm so glad you'll be joining us for this workshop, which is made possible by Google News Initiative. Before we get started, I just want to remind you of a few notes. We are going to be live streaming this session to our YouTube channel. So if you have any technical issues at all with Zoom, you can always tune into the YouTube channel. And we'll be posting a link to that in the chat feature within Zoom. I also want to remind you to use the hashtag ISOJ2020 to tweet out highlights um, on social media and to stay connected with the conference there. So now I would like to introduce you to Michael Grant, who is a teaching fellow at Google News Initiative. He'll be leading us through a workshop called Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in the Newsroom. The power of AI and machine learning is helping journalists around the world in a variety of ways, both big and small. In this workshop, we'll find out how those technologies can help you make sense of large data sets, find patterns in pictures, audio and text, as well as enhance your workflow in powerful ways. So we're excited to be offering this workshop, which wouldn't be possible without Google News Initiative support. And as you're listening to the workshop, please feel free to submit questions in the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll do our best to address those. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our workshop instructor, Michael Grant. Wow, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, again, I'm a teaching fellow at the Google News Lab. Uh, based here in Menlo Park, where it's about um, 9.30, so good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening in some places around the world. Uh, so today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robots in the newsroom. Um, so it's a super um, interesting topic. I think a lot of people are trying to understand more about it, and so this should be a pretty nice primer on um, a lot of the things that are happening in this space. So to get started, I'd love to talk a little bit about what artificial intelligence is. Um, and so the definition that I'll lead with is that it's a set of ideas, technologies, and techniques um, related to the ability of a computer system to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. Uh, so it's kind of like the idea of um, assigning tasks to a computer uh, to carry out functions. I'd love to start with this video this is too. Not a situation where robots are going to be replacing what journalists do. The bigger question is how do we deploy machine learning to actually make us better journalists? Every day in journalism, we're doing a lot of processy robotic tasks to make sure that we're gathering news, producing news. And give me scale. just a second. I need to I see a big benefit coming jump from out AI. and share. So sorry. And just one moment. Okay, great. So let's get back to it. Um, I wanna go ahead and show a quick video that'll really help um, set the tone for uh, this particular talk and kind of give you a quick summary of, um, of artificial intelligence as well. This is not a situation where robots are going to be replacing what journalists do. The bigger question is, how do we deploy machine learning to actually make us better journalists? Every day in journalism, we're doing a lot of processy robotic tasks 
to make sure that we're gathering news, producing news at scale. The way in which I see a big benefit coming from AI is helping with that process. It empowers our journalists to spend more time doing what they do best. It's interviews, research, and investigation, and writing more compelling and creative content. Those things cannot be done by AI. At Google, we believe that AI should benefit society. This means beneficial for the news that people have access to, and the news industry who produces it. This report is an unprecedented insight into a whole range of newsrooms around the world. It tells us what they're doing with AI right now, but it also tells us what they hope to do with it in the future. We can use algorithms to help us find news faster and break news faster. These days, any journalist or any reader will tell you they're completely overwhelmed with information. AI and technology can help with this process by finding relevancy. In the production area, you're looking at what can the machines do really well, which is analyze data, pull things together, find patterns, and even do some natural language processing to write stories off the back of data. We employ AI to provide users with more personalized experiences while maintaining the balance of curation to minimize filter bubbles. AI will help us to get exactly the right content to the right person. And that might be a consumer scrolling through on their mobile phone, or for Reuters, it might be a business client who wants particular content at particular times of the day. Any new technology brings all sorts of challenges to the news industry. And one as complex as AI makes that even more interesting. Clearly there are ethical uh, questions that need to be addressed, things like making sure that our data is not biased or figuring out whether we're going to disclose the uses of automation to audiences. I feel that we're going to need to have new skills in the newsroom of people who understand technology and programming and understand the ethics of journalism. Commonly we have Q&A sessions on AI initiatives so that editorial has a good understanding of what we're actually building, what's feeding into it, and what the outcome is. This type of transparency within our organization is really fundamental to how we build AI. We're all going to be living in a world where AI is ever more significant in all sorts of spheres. And I think it's really important that we understand both the, the powers and opportunities that it brings, but also the challenges and risks. The more all of us work together, the more confident I am will discover further how AI can empower journalists. That's why it's so important that we keep this research and this dialogue going. Wonderful. So uh, that was a, a really great report. Um, and if you caught that bit.ly link, um, it, it's a great way to, uh, to resurface that report. We'll give it another mention a bit later on in this presentation. Uh, but I want to take a quick moment to talk about machine learning. And so machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. Um, and so we're really talking about, um, you know, with AI and machine learning, um, how we can use these technologies as tools in journalism. And so machine learning, for instance, is already in existence in our environment. Um, and we're already seeing it uh, more and more in our everyday lives and in products that we're interacting with. Um, and so some examples of ML in everyday te technologies include things like GPS, um, Google Maps, um, and you might be familiar with, uh, um, with uh, Google X's Waze, um, which is a really awesome uh, self-driving technology car. And so streaming services like Netflix and Spotify are leveraging it, um, as well as Google Search. Um, so in this presentation, we'll go through a few of, um, of the ways that it's actually being used in practice. Um, so one really great example um, that you may or may not be familiar with is Trent. Um, and so, um, or you may have already used Google Translate, for instance, and those are good um, examples of where um, uh, machine learning is helping with translation tools uh, or transcription. So whatever the role is um, in newsrooms or as a freelance journalist, um, you can really start to figure out how to tap in um, to some of the products that are available on the market that leverage the power of machine learning. One really great um, Easter egg in Google Docs, for instance, uh, is 
voice typing. And so voice typing is really awesome because all you have to do is go to the tools menu and um, there's a setting called voice typing and it'll give you an icon that you click and then you just start talking and it'll transcribe right on the fly. Uh, so that's a really nice hack for journalists. Um, and you can also maybe take your pre-recorded um, audio and maybe play it up to your computer and it'll be transcribing from your notes. Um, so I'd love to, for you to um, leverage that um, application of uh, machine learning and transcription. Uh, we're starting to see this as well and other things that we interact with like um, smart playlist uh, and that's everything from Spotify to um, um, maybe like your iTunes. So there is a really wonderful journalism and machine learning report uh, and Google, the Google News Initiative helped uh, contribute and sponsor uh, this reporting and it's with the London School of Economics and Political Science. And so um, it's a really great uh, summary of a lot of um, what the video was talking about. So um, how journalists are able to use machine learning and um, automation and um, AI and the uses of um, journalism. And so what can machine learning do in a newsroom? Um, the, applications are nearly endless and I think we're just starting to scratch the surface uh, and how we can start to leverage these things. So ma machine learning and news gathering, for instance, is um, already at work um, at Thomson Reuters. And so they developed a new tracer, news tracer and Linux Insight. Um, so both tools use machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies to support Reuters journalist and news gathering process. So the tracer is designed to help journalists uh, detect um, activity on Twitter, particularly breaking news. Um, and so it analyzes millions of tweets to identify possible articles and allow newsrooms to detect those breaking news scenarios. Uh, so it's kind of like getting ahead um, of, uh, of the jump in interest um, and being able to identify when we should go out and report something. Um, so you can think of it as a reactionary kind of uh, product there. Um, and then links, um, links insight is designed to identify trends and key factors in large data sets, uh, suggesting new articles to report reporters and providing additional context to and background information. So really great products that uh, Reuters are um, already experimenting with. So I'm going to break this into three sections and the first part we will dive into is how we can use machine learning and um, AI to gather news. Uh, so here's a quick example of um, a news gathering um, uh, method. Uh, and so I will quickly um, show this video here. I'm uh, Charles Xi. Today, I would like to give you a demonstration of Cadence uh, Tensilica Vision DSP technology and a uh, reference to software flow that customers can use to develop neural network applications uh, based on the DSP technology. Uh, the Tensilica Vision P6 DSP is a very high performance uh, SIMD DSP designed for vision and uh, neural network applications. Our partners have integrated the Vision DSP processor into a fully optimized custom ASIC in advanced geometry node. This is a platform that we use for customers uh, and partners to develop applications. In Cadence, we also developed uh, a uh, neural network compiler called XNNC and a set of libraries called XICN library that can be utilized by customers to develop neural network applications. Here I'm showing a very uh, a streamlined flow uh, we can start with any uh, publicly available framework like the cafe or TensorFlow, do the network training, get the optimized uh, network architecture and the train coefficients. Then we feed in the trained model uh, directly to the neural network compiler. The neural network compiler optimizes the layer structure, does quantization, and then eventually map and generate the optimized uh, DSP code using the XICN library function calls. Okay, so that might be um, 
leaning on the technical side, but um, in summary, um, we're using AI in this case uh, for image classifi uh, classification and object recognition. Um, and here's another really interesting example here. So this is called Image Tagger and it's a software program on a PC. And the way it works is uh, you can take a number of images as seen here. And you can drag the folder to the application and hit run. And so um, the machine learning is happening in the background to understand what's the composition of the photo. And you can see it processing those right there. And then now you can see that it's assigned keywords to each one of these images like uh, desktop computer, race car, goldfish, space shuttle, and so on. Uh, so um, we're seeing that there's ways that programmers can bring these kinds of tools to um, the public. And um, as journalists, we're thinking we should be thinking about, um, well, which, how can we start to use some of these programs uh, for our own use? Um, I see a question um, about the voice transcription function in uh, Google Docs. And just really quickly, I want to note that there are, I believe, about 40 languages that are present. Um, and so there is an option under the recording part where you can choose the language. And so if you're speaking in your language, it will translate in, la in that language. Okay, great. So here's another example of, um, of um, AI and, new and news finding. Torcuato de Tela con unas 65 personas más o menos, son expertos y voluntarios que vinieron a chequear en vivo el discurso del presidente. Empezamos a hacer esto hace siete años, o sea, este es el séptimo chequeo colectivo en vivo. So this tool is live, is about live checking. Lo hacemos eh, con la ayuda de la automatización. Desde hace tiempo Chequeado está trabajando en una plataforma que se llama Chequeabot, que es lo que nos permite es encontrar frases chequeables, y relacionarlas con chequeos previos. Pero la novedad de este año es que estamos usando... Uh oh, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, just in summary, um, the tool um, that uh, Chequeado uh, is using here is um, basically allowing for, um, uh, for the transcription of, um, of speech and then being able to then um, run AI to um, uh, fact check and say, you know, whether um, something, uh, some phrase is um, fact checkable. Um, so it's, it's really awesome. I won't go through the entire video and pain you through the, uh, through reading a translation, but I, I think this is a, just another really um, awesome example. Let's just talk about news production now. So machine learning for news production is another um, key area. And so, uh, Tools that use machine learning to reduce the time spent transcribing or translating information are good examples of how this technology can be useful in the press industry. But the use of machine learning in news production goes much further. A wide variety of media, including Bloomberg, The Washington Post, and the Associated Press, have begun applying different machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques to automatically produce news articles at scale. So the main objective is that journalists can focus on the most creative aspects of their work uh, as far as like delegating or uh, doing redundant tasks. And um, uh, rec recent case studies show the benefits um, might exceed our expectations. And so we'll take a look at some of these. Sports journalists have an important but difficult role to play in soccer matches. They need to simultaneously follow everything that happens during the match and write a high quality article. After the match ends, the report has to be complete and ready, even if a goal is made in the very last minute. A few extra eyes and hands wouldn't go amiss. PASS was developed by journalists for journalists. It's a powerful tool that keeps track of all the match statistics in real time and builds a report from that. The journalist then bases their article on the PASS match report. This saves journalists time 
and eliminates the need for time-consuming repetitive tasks. So they can focus their attention on capturing the atmosphere and covering the player's background stories. Pass allows journalists to write rich, detailed articles about matches quickly. For more information, please check our website. Great, so um, that's just one example of um, a use of AI in sports. Um, and you can imagine this, uh, that kind of approach could be used for things like business and um, uh, performance charts for uh, stocks and markets. Another interesting use of AI in journalism is um, a tool called Wordsmith by Automated Insights. Um, and so you can see here that um, uh, it shows that each story um, is a collection of data. Um, and so it can log things like tables, graphs, lists, and so on. Um, and so you're seeing some of the keywords here um, that are highlighted. Um, and, um, and so uh, it's helping to write these stories based on uh, some of the things that it understands about uh, the subject matter. So the software scours through its trove of data looking for insights and facts that it can figure out from the data. Like um, a human journalist, it's trying to understand uh, the questions um, that might be there or questions that people might ask. Um, and so I had the uh, privilege of um, interviewing some folks from the team during my fellowship year, for instance, and understanding more about um, how automated insights is um, thinking about this. And so um, it's now being used by some um, larger publishers. And it really does help fill um, holes in our journalism coverage, particularly where maybe the amount of content that needs to be produced in the area um, uh, can be um, supplemented by the use of, um, of machine, um, like uh, uh, AI to draft and, and, and produce the text. So it's really interesting here. So uh, Wordsmith uses a virtual tree. Each branch of the tree is a possible way to tell the story. Um, and so by comparing the data, it can decide which branch it should follow. Um, the sentence was only included because it decided to reserve scored because it decided uh, the reserve scored particularly well. So it's trying to understand and analyze performance um, based on what it's understanding about the content that it's pulling from. Very interesting. So the Associated Press um, found answers in automation uh, with words with with the wordsmith platform and automated insights uh, and so um, to support journalists AP began automating NCAA division one men's basketball previews um, during the 2018 season using wordsmith and data um, from the stats perform uh, from the stats platform um, so again this is really great for supplemental where we might not want to throw our resources into things that um, are super high octane and there's just tons of content that um, that we'd ha have a hard time even covering with manpower. Uh, so this is a great instance where we can throw technology at the at that particular problem and start to really surface things that might be useful to an audience. And so AP is taking um, advantage of this approach. Um, Vice is also taking advantage of uh, machine learning. And so machine learning can help um, expand the reach of local language news content. Um, so for example, in this Vice, uh, in this Vice example, 500 editors um, at Vice publish uh, eight, uh, articles in 18 different languages. And so they tapped into the technology of uh, Google Translate um, which is powered by machine learning. Um, and so um, they were able to integrate this into their content management system and, uh, and then translate for um, other languages. So uh, really awesome use of taking uh, some of the um, technology that, that's out there, uh, particularly in, uh, from this, in this case from Google and being able to integrate that into 
um, what they have to offer uh, their customer. So Lexio is a really interesting um, new tool as well. And so um, it says you can, um, uh, you can use data uh, to basically um, tell a story. So let's take a quick look at that. Hi, I'm Stu, and here's a one minute demo overview of Lexio. First, it's important to know that Lexio is accessible from both your browser as well as the Lexio app on your phone. After logging in, the first thing you see is the newsfeed. Here you'll have cards from all different areas of your business that you've connected to Lexio. Talk to your admin if you'd like getting connected to more data. Here users can set up different topics to help filter your feed based on your use case. Notice that I have a ton here set up already from different functional areas of a business. Things like sales, customer success, marketing, HR, and more. If you see a card that looks interesting to you and you want to dive deeper, just click on the card and Lexia will write an entire story for you. Everything you see here was written by Lexio and users has a, have a ton of functionality to change timeframes, add filters, to share with other people, comment, and more. Lexio's user interface makes it easy for anyone to break down the data to get the information they need to be successful. Have any questions? Don't hesitate to, hesitate to reach out to our team. Awesome, so that's another um... Uh, approach to being able to um, generate storytelling from a data set. All right, and then I'll take questions or I'll, I'll read through the questions when we come to the end of the presentation. So don't worry, I'll try my best to answer as many of them as I can. Um, so next we'll talk about news distribution. So machine learning for news distribution is another um, really great opportunity in journalism. And so um, Yale News Lab um, of the Finnish public broadcasting company used machine learning to create uh, Voito Smart News Assistant uh, for its NewsWatch application. And so the assistant is hosted on the lock screen of mobile devices and it recommends interesting news content to the user through alerts and notifications. Um, it leverages machine learning to improve its recommendations and, um, and it learns from user interactions on the lock screen. Um, so this is kind of like that um, uh, learning from the user right on the, um, the application. And so in addition, the user can teach the assistant feedback directly through notifications and um, in the news application itself. So machine learning can also help news organizations improve their business model. For example, um, adjusting flexible pages, uh, payment pages for your subscribers. Uh, so this, in this example, um, uh, content is being so uh, so sourced around um, uh, users' um, interest. And so this definitely aligns with um, personalization and um, hopefully hitting on uh, some of the um, uh, the key interest of the user in order to really um, just be a display of value in every piece of content. Um, this theme and post, I think, hits the nail on the head where it says, not all new site visitors are created equal. So uh, Shipstead is trying to predict the ones who will pay up. And so um, being able to get insights into um, what the users are there for, um, is really great when you're when we're coming up with um you know with a call to action um and so i highly recommend that you um take a look at reading this article because it, it really is um kind of uh the direction that we're starting to see news organizations go in and that might be a great opportunity for your news organization um so the times is also um uh playing with this approach to um personalizing uh, news pages and um, um, creating uh, uh, calls to action and, and being able to um, start to see if there's a difference in um, monetization between just kind of surfacing, um, you know, the curation versus doing it based around um, um, a user's like reading history. Uh, this is a really interesting um, tool being used by um, uh, the New York Times. And so um, 
We can use machine learning to in newsrooms to encourage healthy, productive conversations. And we know that comments uh, can be quite toxic. And so this is a, a toxicity scale. And so by adjusting the slider, we can um, uh, accept or um, deny certain types of commenting based on the toxicity of the content that we're seeing there. Uh, so a very fascinating use of, of, um, of using machine learning. And this is part of a project uh, with Jigsaw, which is also um, uh, a Google company um, that is doing a lot in, um, in understanding approaches to machine learning and AI um, in journalism. Okay, so this example is um, how we might train custom machine learning models. Uh, so there's a Cloud Auto ML, uh, which is a suite of machine learning products that enables developers with limited machine learning uh, expertise to train quality models. And so um, I think this is a, a very simplistic but understandable example of, you know, um, of what it looks like to train a model. All right, and so. Auto ML vision, their vision is to uh, be the first product to be released and it's simple, secure and flexible ML service that lets you train custom vision, vision models for your own use cases. Um, so they have some really exciting things brewing over there that we should pay attention to. Next, um, this is just a really wonderful example of um, of using machine learning to identify photos. And so um, there were thousands of photos uh, fed to a machine um, and uh, we're able to then detail and, um, and tag the images uh, that are there. So I guess resurfacing archive photos and being able to um, group them and categorize them is a really powerful way that we can um, reinvigorate some of our old and exist existing content um, by um, running our imagery through uh, machine learning in order to um, organize that into something that's a lot more digestible and easily findable. Um, so this comes from Google Arts and Culture um, with Time Life. The ICIJ um, did a really um, fascinating um, investigation of, um, of looting the seas, and that is basically uh, uh, pirates that uh, do illegal fishing. And so um, this has had a major environmental impact on um, journalism. Um, so the series uh, on overfishing in the Pacific was a classic data-driven investigative story. And reporters ask for data from the government. Uh, the government says no. Uh, so they then ask again. And finally, they receive data through sources um, and begin to explore and look at that data. All right. And so um, it's very time consuming to look through large amounts of data. Um, and so sometimes we might uh, consider how we might leverage the power of technology to do that. Um, one incredible um, uh, application that has been built around uh, global fishing data is the Global Fishing Watch. All right, and so this was also built um, in uh, collaboration with Google. And so this is uh, real-time data being fed into the application so that we around the world um, in several parts of um, society, but journalists as well, or governments, we can start to monitor um, where activity is occurring. This is more or less how it works. So um, we have ship movement data um, being uh, 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 sent to a place. Um, we have localization happening. Um, there's training data that's being um, labeled, and then um, it's being batched in, and, uh, and then fed into um, 
the, uh, uh, the application where we can then visualize it. So there's a lot happening in the, in the background, but uh, for the user, it's really great that you can just go to um, the interface, which looks like this, um, and start to explore that data with lots of um, um, ways that you can filter uh, or look at specific types of data, um, track down certain ships and vessels, or see like where in the world, let's say, um, where there is um, restrictions on fishing, where you can see vessels uh, starting to enter um, that area. And so if that's happening, that sounds like a really um, a big opportunity to report. Uh, so here are some examples of um, what's being tracked um, using um, location data on um, vessels. Awesome. So um, this led to uh, reporting recently um, about illegal fishing as well, um, which resulted in a $2.2 million fine of uh, one fishery. Um, and so again, these are opportunities that, um, that the data presents us in um, sourcing new reporting um, that's super important to, um, to all of our lives and, and the food chain and, um, and the fate of a uh, fish in the sea. So Global, Global Fishing Watch has now made this public data um, and it's working with the research community um, and NGOs to broaden the reach of this data to potentially track not only overfishing but to help build more sustainable supply chains of fish. Uh, the New York Times has also um, leveraged that data in its storytelling and um, told um, a really fascinating story um, in this example, um, which I uh, um, encourage you to check out. And we can also still tell stories about how environmental disasters um, like oil spills can affect food supply. And so this example comes from Reuters graphics. Um, other news organizations are also experimenting with uh, machine learning in their reporting. Um, so last year, BuzzFeed uh, did a really interesting story about um, uh, hidden spy planes. Um, so it's analyzing activity of planes in the sky and um, pairing that knowledge of, um, of the course of planes with um, deep investigative reporting, um, they were able to show, um, you know, um, or understand which ones of these planes were hidden spy planes. And Google did a project with ProPublica documenting hate, which uses AI to generate nat a national database of hate crimes and bias incidents. Um, and so that was super interesting. Um, because there isn't one central database for uh, tracking hate crime. And so this is definitely an example of um, being able to compile um, lots of um, reports um, and start to turn that into a repository um, that helps journalists source um, more um, um, reporting and start adding new reporting. And so the team used uh, Google natural, the Google's natural language API to scan a raw feed of Google News Alerts. And it pulls out information about people, locations, events, and identifies potential incidents of hate crimes. Uh, and so that's a really great starting point to having something of um, an index. Um, and so um, they took that data and put it into a visual explorer that helps reporters um, uh, to like tips and other sources. So really great content there. The AP is also um, using this to smartly um, analyze uh, what parts of, um, of you know, the, the ring will yield a, a really great photo. And so this boxing, boxing match was captured uh, by one of AP's AI powered cameras. 
And in 2016, Google worked with USC and the Gina Davis Institute to build a tool that would help measure um, gender bias in film. So here's just a roundup, um, and I, I would encourage you to maybe like uh, take a screenshot of this, but here's a um, machine learning use cases. So uh, it's, it's a roundup, so you can use machine learning for metadata tagging or sentiment analysis or speech to text. Um, you can use it to classify information from say like photos, videos, um, or text content. Uh, you can use it in translating and you can use it to even create content. So those are, uh, a there's a wide spectrum of opportunities to use machine learning um, in journalism. And so um, these are avenues that you might consider as you're thinking about um, applying this to uh, your journalism or maybe building something new. I just want to shout out a really great resource and it comes from uh, QZ. Um, so Quartz uh, has a really great um, AI studio. So that's one great place that you can just kind of keep up with updates or about um, AI and machine learning and newsrooms. Now, I'd be remiss not to um, mention um, deep fakes and disinformation. So there are challenges and dangers derived from artificial intelligence. And I won't go too deep here, but I just want to um, you know, to surface that um, this is something that we are aware of. Um, and so uh, there is the uh, nearly famous um, example of the Obama deepfake um, uh, example. Um, I'll play that really quickly. 42 cities, 60 shows. Uh oh, I gotta add. Really takes care of me. Do you ever cook? I don't cook ever. The first one, I've never done stand up. Should totally upgrade. Sorry, guys. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, Sim never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would, someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. So that was Jordan Peele doing his uh, Obama voice and, um, and a, uh, uh, a deep fake of Obama uh, talking. And so, um, you know, it gets really interesting. And here's another example of um, uh, actor, you know, doing um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Pacino um, voices, uh, impersonations, and um, seeing that his face actually um, is changed to um, to resemble uh, the actor that he's impersonating. Um, and then uh, here, here's just the title alone: Art Meets Artificial Intelligence. Being able to see um, an artificial um, sample or example um, of um, of music by uh, you know famous uh, musician. Um, so at this time, what I'd like to do is just kind of show you at least um, a practical um, example of Project Backlight and how we at Google are testing um, using. Um, machine learning and um, text analysis um, in, in journalism. And so Backlight allows users to quickly search through thousands of documents. Um, and um, so you can, you can, as a user, um, upload your, you know, your PDFs or those FOIAs and it's going to be able to analyze thousands of those. And the analysis um, can be performed on um, several file formats, including PDFs, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, plain text, images, emails, and yes, even audio. Um, the tool allows you to see the big picture. So um, you'll notice that in this interface, there's um, all the documents. Uh, in this case, there were 30,788. 
JFK assassination records. And so it's already um, filtered the documents by people, organizations, and locations. So using machine learning um, in uploading these documents, it's going to analyze them and then categorize them um, in a way that helps us as journalists uh, sift through all this um, information in a way that can help inform um, our journalism and really kind of save lots of time. Great. So that's Project Backlight. Um, and at this time, what I can do, if you're interested in that, is um, there's a sign up. Uh, so um, we welcome you to, um, to go to goo.gle slash get backlight. Um, and you can um, sign up for the waiting list. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, you can email um, Megan Chan at google.com or myself. Um, and my email is um, grantmichael at google.com. I just want to make a quick shout out that you can also test out other tools um, by going to the g.co slash news training website. Um, so this is an all it's a free website for journalists to use. You can go in your spare time and check out other trainings that are in things like um, data journalism or environmental journalism. And we're always um, adding new modules there. So uh, check that out and, and, and visit on your own time when you'd like. So at this point, I can kind of close out and uh, open up for questions. Um, but here's all the ways that you can contact me and um, the Google News Lab. Uh, here's my direct email. So again, um, if you're interested in, um, in Backlight, um, feel free to email me direct, grantmichael at google.com. And so thank you so much. And at this time, we can go ahead and open for questions. do is I will I'll source some questions right here on screen and see what I can get to here okay so uh, I tackled the uh, Google voice function all right so tools so when you want to use voice typing here, here, here's the, the method you go to tools, voice typing. Um, it'll give you, um, this little, uh, icon here, but there's a drop down. It says English U S but now you can see that we can scroll to the language that we would like. And it looks like they've added more than 40 now. Great. So adding more all the time. And you can position this where, where you would like it. OK, great. So that's how that works. Um, from a SHISC voice recognition application, sometimes consider people's voices for completely different words. Can you always depend on them? So you know, um, I think this conversation is to kind of establish a baseline for um, what is out there in journalism and, um, and our goals to uh, support the development of, um, of using some of those technologies. And so we're always going to use our journalistic integrity. Um, I don't have any specifics on how to answer that specifically, but you're right. I think your questions are right. How do we use machines to enhance our work for those in corporate or public information? Um, yeah, so now that we're at the close, it looks like I got this question a little earlier. So we did share some openly like public um, products that are out there. And so I think it's about using our creativity. Um, I often see that, you know, um, there's, there might be a tool used for one thing and we try to repackage it and use it for another. Um, and so that might not, might even be, um, you know, a great way to start to figure out, you know, um, what we might be able to build within our own news organizations or in this case, uh, corporate or public information. Um, thanks for the assist on uh, Checkbot. Uh, does machine learning differentiate accurate versus inaccurate information? 
I think you may have to check with that team specifically um, on their particular approach. Um, and you're always going to want to check maybe like the methodology or um, the docs. So um, if you're a developer and you're on uh, or interested in more about the development of particular applications, um, if it's open source anyway, there's um, going to be some really great documentation about approaches. Just doing a time check here. Let me see. Okay. What concerns are there about biases being built into machine learning, channeling uh, attention to certain content? Um, you know, I know that, um, and I'm just drawing from things that I know about um, at this point. So um, ProPublica, for instance, did some really great reporting about, um, you know, um, an application that, you know, was being used um, in courts. Um, and so, you know, blacks were being convicted at a higher rate based on um, what a machine was able to um, surface about them. And so, um, so you know, uh, it's, I think it's our job as journalists to um, figure out um, and investigate, you know, uh, uh, the performance of different types of um, models that are being created or um, um, other machine learning use cases. Uh, and so that's, I think that really speaks to the importance of, you know, having more technologists doing this important work so that we can be the check on things like technology. All right, I've got about five minutes left. I'm just going to try to source uh, the ones that I know I can give a really great answer to. Does voice typing features enable uh, this? Uh, so voice typing is only on the desktop version. Mario Garcia, do you think uh, machine learning will be able to produce understanding content or messages using something like sarcasm? Um, I know that there there are there there are a couple of projects that I've seen, um, and Mario, um, I can get back to you on that. Um, and for anyone who might have a particular question, you can always direct it to me as well at grantmichael at google.com. Um, but I'd love to surface those um, those instances where that's being um, played with. I know that um, pudding dot cool uh, the pudding has done uh, something with um, Elmo emojis, and so uh, they are using um, um, sentiment or emotion to uh, to like measure and show visually um, um, sentiment um, and sarcasm. So that that's kind of cool. Um, could, would it be able to fact check information in real time? Um, that's a great question. How much coding knowledge is required to use Google's AI ML products and reporting? And if some is required, are there good resources, tutorials for getting hands dirty? Um, that's a great question. I mean, um, in my exploration, so I don't have a coding, well, I'm basically a front end coder. Um, I'm not a programmer uh, specifically. Um, and so uh, when I did my fellowship at Stanford, for instance, I ended up in a class called um, the Lean Launchpad. And um, I, I worked with uh, Titus, who was also a fellow during my year. Um, he's with TAM Media, uh, that's T A M E D I A. And so we explored uh, personalization. He's written about it extensively. And so I think if you uh, tech check out Titus Plattner and some of his posts about um, personalization, uh, I think he can give you some really great ideas about how to introduce yourself to that world. Um, and if you can't program it yourself, it's, it might be great to team up with programmers who can um, and, and start to inch your way to what, it, what it's like to um, experiment. Um, and I've written uh, a Neiman piece a couple of years ago about the importance of experimentation in journalism. So check that out as well, because it might be a great primer. All right, uh, let me just do a quick time check. Five minutes and, um, and it looks like that was four minutes ago. So 
I'm sorry that I can't get to everyone's questions right now, um, but I really hope that you enjoyed spending some time with us. There's a lot of information here um, and apparently this is being recorded. So feel free to come back, um, you know, at me um, with questions, DMs, I'm cool with those. And thank you so much um, for having me. I really appreciate spending some time with you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Great, thank you so much, Michael, for being with us. Um, that was really helpful and informative and really interesting just to see how a lot of the organizations that we know, and in some cases, some of the workshop attendees may work for, um, are really using AI. So I especially liked the projects that you shared from Vice and Trent and Chequiato. Um, really interesting to see how AI is shaping the way that we tell stories and engage with audiences and personalize the news. So thank you so much, Michael, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again to Google News Initiative for sponsoring this workshop. Um, so to everyone in attendance, I just want to remind you about the panels that are coming up this afternoon. So our next one is going to be at 1 p.m. Central, and we'll be exploring how COVID-19 is being covered in journalism um, and looking at sort of how journalists can develop best practices around their coverage of it now and moving forward. And then at 4 p.m. Central, we'll be exploring sort of the importance of going beyond traditional fact checking in the world of journalism. So I encourage you to visit isoj.org for more details about each of these panels. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you later this afternoon as ISOJ 2020 continues. Thank you.